Welcome to Video Game Hangover. I'm Randy Dickinson, and I'm in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Hello, I'm DJ Ross. I am in Mountain View, California. Each week here on Video Game Hangover, we talk about the games that have been keeping us up at night. This week, we're playing We Are OFK, Final Fantasy XIV Island Sanctuary, and we're checking out the demo for Harvestella. Yeah. Yeah. And now the backlog attack has officially wrapped up. We can get back to the important things, like talking about Final Fantasy XIV Final every Fantasy. week. <laughs> and farming games. And farming. Oh, yeah. Well, I got a you know, double feature for you today. <laughs> Are you farming your island sanctuary? We're doing a little farming. What? What or a something. treat. Are we? Yeah, I guess we are. Yeah. <laughs> what would... a treat. Yeah. <laughs> that was my, my number one like takeaway from the giant Nintendo Direct last week was, no, not the title of the new... Uh, uh, Legend of Zelda game, which was awkward, but Breath of the Wild was awkward <laughs> yeah. when I first heard of it, too. Um, but yeah, holy shit, there's a lot of farming games coming out. We have reached critical farming mass. Were there farming games announced? I didn't actually watch the thing live. No. Uh, so maybe I just tuned them out. There were a lot. There were at least four. That is a lot. Mm. How many farming games can you play simultaneously? How many farming games are you playing right this instant? Um, three, three. What really? Well, fi- uh, Animal Crossing. I'm still playing Animal Crossing. Okay, sure. Um, you made a I- comment where you're like, "Well, I'm obligated to play all farming games," and I just thought, <laughs> "What farming games do you actually play? Like, when did you decide this?" <laughs> well, I play a lot of games that have farming in them. They're not necessarily. F- well, it's not like Farming Simulator. Okay. Um, well, sure, sure. Yeah, but you you are involved in. The process of farming at some point. It's not like a game that there's a farm next door. Multiple crops growing on multiple farms across multiple video <laughs> games. Yeah. Um, I have others that I will talk about in future episodes of the show, but yeah, I uh, oh. yeah. Not that it's a big surprise. Uh, I'm just trying to think, because I, all I could think of was you played Stardew, and it seemed like you didn't really care for it. So Did not. there must be two other games out there that you're playing. Yeah. I didn't do a lot of. I didn't get to the point in Stardew Valley where I did a lot of farming, honestly. What? Um, well, I, maybe that's your problem. I did a lot of walking in circles trying to figure out why, when do I get to farm. Um, no, but I'm playing um, Cult of the Lamb has a pretty robust uh, f- farming element to it. And I've sure. been playing Ooblets, uh, which uh, has yeah. uh, its own sort of fairly robust farming element to it. So. Um, so yeah, I am, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm farming currently on no less than three separate farms. Okay. All right. Yeah. I forgot about those. Well, every game really does have farming in it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember the exact titles of the ones that they announced, uh, last week on the uh, Nintendo direct. I think Harvestella was shown, was it not? Um, yeah, but in addition yeah, to Harvestella, so. there were a couple of other ones. Yeah. Harvestella two, Octopath Harvestella. I don't know. <laughs> Octostella Traveler. Octostella. <laughs> Octofarm Traveler. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, yeah. Just, just one of the 17 video games that Square Enix has coming out this week. Yeah. Oh, man. If you went back in time and told my uh, high school self that, you'd be like, probably just have a seizure. <laughs> too, too many Squaresoft <laughs> games coming out. And now I can't even keep track of them all. So yeah. I don't know what to do. Well, all the logos look the same. All the fonts are exactly identical. It's just really hard to sort of differentiate between all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's just farming or wielding an enormous sword. Yep. That's all you need, though. Final farm <laughs> Uh If you don't like the sword, you can go do some farming. We've got something yep. for everybody. Yep. Yep. It seems like it's where sort of the the farming thing is going is it's not it's not the Animal Crossing like you know what do they call it like a life sim kind of situation where or, or uh, what's it called 
Stardew Valley, I guess, is sort of a life sim in that way, too. You're, you're not really... It's not like a high stakes, like, dungeon crawler or anything like that, but it seems like they're putting farming in all of that other stuff now, <laughs> where it's sort of like, sometimes you'll have a sword and there'll be monsters, but the rest of the time you'll just be farming. Do you think that's what's going on? Like, it started out, suddenly you just started gaining experience points in every game, and then suddenly you're crafting in every game, and now it's right. just farming? Yeah. It seems more uh, more surprising than those other two things. Yeah. Or know. like gardening, maybe. There was there was a garden in that Star Wars game. That didn't make any sense. Correct. Yeah, you had a little garden on the ship. Yep. Hmm. Yeah. People just love uh, love raising plants, I guess. Yeah. Are you a plant person? Do you have plants in your house? Do you grow oh, plants? Oh, no, no. Don't, no. don't give me a plant. They, it's like a death sentence for them. I had a couple of good summers where I was like, I'm going to be a person who grows things. And then, uh, and I live in a city, but I somehow, like a gopher, got into my patio and ate all of the stuff off of our patio. Well, because there are probably very few patios with stuff growing on them to choose right. between. Um, but yeah, I was making, um, I was I growing jalapenos, I was growing little tomatoes, I was growing cucumbers, I was going to make pickles. Um, yeah. And in an afternoon, while I was at work, and my plants should have been happily growing in the sun. Uh, some little gopher came and just wiped out everything. Is that a thing in farming games? You have to deal with wildlife like that? Animal Crossing is very stress-free in that regard. Yeah, yeah. They just grow. And if you don't pick them, they just continue to sort of like be there. Yeah. In every farming game I've played, it's always just a matter of, well, did you give it enough water? Or did you plant them in the right conditions or whatever? They never mentioned a gopher or anything. <laughs> yeah. In, um, who is it in? In Cult of the Lamb, uh, crows will come and eat your seeds. Uh. Um, but if you put up a scarecrow, it has an area of effect that will scare them away. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. Uh, you can put up multiple scarecrows eventually if you have the resources. Um, yeah. And then you can upgrade your scarecrow so that it comes with a little trap. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, the trap will capture the crows and turn it into a little chunk of meat that uh. you can then feed to your cultists. Oh man, there's a lot of crazy shit in that video game. I will, <laughs> I will, I will explain further next week. But yeah, that's just a glimpse of one of the many horrific things you can do to your cute animal cultists. All right. Yeah, I was just thinking about the amazing farm we had going in Valheim while we were playing that game, my friends and I, a few years ago. Was that just last year? That's wild. We had a whole little like remote farm outpost, which was exciting, and uh, people would take shifts like checking in on it. Because we'd need the resources to, to cook meals for when we were out fighting monsters or whatever. But uh, yeah, that was kind of a nice little little detour. Like if you didn't go out, uh, you didn't feel like fighting monsters on a particular session, you could just go and hang out on the farm for a while. It was cool. Let's do some farming. Yeah, but that was like a survival game. So you kind of expect to, or at least I expect that you'll be sort of raising your own food at some point. I end up doing a lot in Cult of the Lamb again. I end up doing a lot of the farming at night because your cultists have to sleep. Um, mm -hmm. You have to build little bunkers for them and, and teepees, essentially, if, at first, and then you can upgrade them later. Um, but uh, they'll put in a good solid day of worship and, you know, tending your cult property. Um, and that includes some farming and planting seeds and chasing away crows and things like that. But then at the end of the day, they get tired and they want to go to sleep. You can make them continue working, um, <laughs> but you risk a revolt. Um, sure. <laughs> Rightfully so. so. Right, so I tend to be a thoughtful cultist and let them get a good solid, you know, five or six hours a night. Um, but you don't have to sleep oh, as the cult. Very generous. I thank you. Um, but as the uh, as the cult leader, you're not required to sleep. The game doesn't make you sleep. Uh, I don't think it even has a mechanic for it. So while they're sawing Z's, uh, I will go and uh, you know tend the crops and pick all the stuff and plant new seeds and things like that. So um, that's my nighttime gig in Cult of the Lamb. While everybody's asleep, I am tending the fields. Well, very productive of you. Yeah, I, I am nothing if not a thoughtful cult leader. Sure, <laughs> that's what I hear. <laughs> yeah. Go to vghangover.com to buy that on a t-shirt. <laughs> Get our own little t-shirt like merch store up and running. <laughs> Gotta do something with all these episode titles. Yeah, Right, exactly. The non-sequiturs were used for titles. <laughs> But yeah, I, and and as promised, more on Cult of the Lamb next week. Okay, yeah, I'm curious. Yeah. I'm uh, I don't know what's going on with that game. So I played a bunch of farming games, sort of unintentionally, because one of them 
isn't a game that I was playing anyway. Mm-hmm. My game does not have any farming in it, so maybe we should like like do a farming sandwich. You do a farm game, I do a not farm <laughs> game, and then we end with a farm game. Okay. Does that work for you? Yeah, yeah, let's let's do it. Let's try the farming okay. sandwich. Which uh which uh what game would you like to be the top? Well no, will you build a sandwich from the bottom up? Which 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 um <laughs> which game would you like to be the bottom piece of bread on our farming sandwich? Well this is just getting confusing now. It's getting super weird now, yeah. Okay. I was planning to start with the island sanctuary because I feel like that is a less potentially less substantial experience than Harvestella, which is the actual proper game that uh Actually, not entirely a farming game either, but whatever. Mm-hmm. But this island sanctuary thing is notable because they actually... So this is a component of Final Fantasy fourteen. if you missed that. They originally announced it when they announced the most recent expansion. They mentioned, oh, as part of this, we're going to include this sort of side mode called Island Sanctuary, which is intended to be sort of casual side content that you can enjoy at your own pace. And, you know, you don't have to compete with other players or worry about falling behind or anything. And that's all they said about it. (laughs) And the community went nuts. Because somehow they decided, like, oh, you know, housing is kind of an issue in this game. It's a very low supply of housing for people. So maybe this island sanctuary is the solution to all of our housing problems. We're going to get a new free house to hang out in on this island. Another part of the community said, oh, this must just be the Animal Crossing mode, which I feel like is, uh, like, what does it even mean to to begin with? What does it mean if you just say, oh, this is Animal Crossing in this other game? Well, I feel like yeah. even games that are directly trying to be Animal Crossing don't quite capture what it means to be Animal Crossing. Yeah, it's a very sort of specific and, and special combination of things, yeah. Yeah. So when people were saying that, oh, they're just adding Animal Crossing to the to Final Fantasy, I thought, well, I don't know what that means. That could mean a lot of things. <laughs> Let them try. So, yeah. <laughs> Speculation just ran wild for months until this finally came out a few weeks ago. Did you have a theory? What was your operating theory? Not, not uh, informed or uninformed by, you know, the loudest voices on the internet. What was your thought that this was going to be? Well, first of all, I felt like both of those theories were not correct. <laughs> so, so I was pretty sure it wasn't going to be housing because I feel like they would have just told people that instead sure. of uh, letting them get their hopes up. Uh, and then again with the Animal Crossing thing, like I don't know what that means. Are there going to be neighbors on the island? What does Animal Crossing mean to me? It does. I mean, I like the idea of it just being an island getaway, uh, like the most recent Animal Crossing. So that's kind of appealing. But uh, mm-hmm. I didn't really feel like that was going to be it. My theory I had in my head was. I don't know. It's going to be more of like a side mini game that uh, is very like systems based because that's how all the other, or how much of the other side content in this game works. It's kind of a tricky thing, I imagine, designing something like this for an MMO because you need something that works with players over like a potentially a very long span of time. Right. Like you don't want to just turn out something that people will be done with in a week. And yet it needs to also be interesting for them to keep coming back to it for for like months at a time, potentially. Or provide some sort of tangible in-game benefit. Yes, well, that's ultimately, that's the most important thing. They need to get some kind of tangible reward out of it, or else they just won't do it. Which sounds very shallow, but in my experience, that is the truth, so. Hmm. Return on investment. What's the ROI on the island sanctuary? Exactly. Like, what is, why... Is it worthwhile for me to go and, and hang out in the island sanctuary instead of doing whatever else I'm going to be, or whatever else I would otherwise be doing? But as a, as the release came closer and closer, I, I thought, well, maybe it will just be kind of a, a chill place to hang out, like in Animal Crossing. Because, um, man, this last expansion was so sort of like, the stakes were very high. A lot of significant things happened in the storyline. So... It feels appropriate that your character in the game might want a vacation afterward. <laughs> so I thought, well, that's just great. Maybe it'll just be like the scenic thing. Maybe we'll just get to hang out on this island. And then it comes out, and it turns out that the sort of way it's introduced to you in the game is one of the more entrepreneurial NPCs you hang out with has come up with this whole like deserted island 
uh, vacation package as uh, sort of a new money-making scheme. And I thought, well, okay, this, well, this sounds very familiar. Mm. And you get shipped off of this island, which is, the first of all, you just get your own private island, which is very nice. And it's this huge, expansive map. Very gorgeous to just explore around. Uh, and I thought, well, this is great. So what do you actually do here? And you keep talking to this uh, this NPC, and uh, she explains that, you know, you're not just here on vacation. Sure, like, have a, you know, a refreshing beverage every once in a while. But she, like, gives you all these little, like, robots to put to work, just building sort of a uh, an infrastructure. Like, you go out and gather materials, and then you bring the materials to the robots, and they build sort of island souvenirs that they ship back to the mainland and sell on the markets. So you can get, ring a profit out of this thing. Mm-hmm. So, so I realized, like, oh, I'm not the uh, the villager in this weird Animal Crossing scenario. I am Tom Nook. <laughs> I'm just trying to like ring a business out of this thing. It's very weird. And the whole time you're talking to these robots, the robots seem just really strangely cynical and lazy and like <laughs> kind of pro capitalist which is strange <laughs> because they're talking about you like you get to this island and it's just it's, it's completely untouched by humanity and they you talk to them and they immediately go like oh would you like for us to clear out some of this this awful <laughs> like undeveloped brush so you can build a we start building the <laughs> engines of capitalism here like oh <laughs> sure and what an interesting or unusual way of, of putting that <laughs> bunch of bootlickers yeah so the initial hours of this were very strange like the, it was fun to hang out uh on this new unknown island and try and figure out what the deal is with uh figuring out where the, the resources are located because you have to go out initially and gather them by hand and then bring them back to uh, the robots and give them orders to build stuff in the the workshop and there's also like wildlife on the island you can capture and bring back to this pasture where they can graze. And then, of course, there's the farm where you plant seeds that you encounter. But ultimately, the things that you grow on the farm and, you know, as you take care of the animals, you can gather materials from them like feathers or fur or something like that. Everything just gets funneled back to the workshop so the robots can build little trinkets and make you some cash on the side. And it almost feels like in Monster Hunter, between hunts, you would come back to sort of the home base and there would be all these different NPCs who you could talk to. Like some of them, sometimes they would manage to farm themselves or they would be little uh, the little cat explorers who would go out and explore a region and bring back resources from it. But it feels very similar to that where it's just something you can visit and do all these little tasks and kind of set things up. And then you come back the next day and check in on their progress. And sometimes they'll have little like rewards for you. And uh, sometimes they will have sold stuff on the market that they construct in the workshop. Uh, and then, of course, you use the profits from this to buy uh, shiny new prizes from the island store. So ultimately, it does uh, provide some incentives for people who are maybe unsure of why they would be spending their time on this island. Mm-hmm. And is this fun? Um, I wasn't initially super thrilled with it, because a lot of the early hours are just you going out and gathering materials by hand. It felt almost like, you know, the first week in New Horizons and Animal Crossing, where you just didn't have materials for anything. So you'd be like, oh, a branch, I need a branch, and then <laughs> oh, how many the rocks can I find? Yes. And oh no, I've, I've gathered all the rocks on the island, <laughs> when are there going to be more rocks? Because I need rocks for something. <laughs> and then at the same time, you have to like start all these, um, get all these structures under construction. Uh, and that, similar uh, to Animal Crossing, is sort of time-gated. So you'll set one up and they'll be like, okay, this will be done in 12 hours. So come back in 12 hours and there's nothing really else you can do until then. But then as you get things further developed, as you get more of this infrastructure in place, you get more and more um, into how the workshop work so you you're able to sort of fund more uh more of an agenda at the workshop like put more things into the into production mm-hmm. and uh, 
at first I thought, well, this this is the thing that seems most incongruous to the whole picture of just hanging out on a deserted island and you know living the life, because you're just submitting work orders to these robots and sort of managing an inventory of resources and build times and things like that. And there are all these other little little nuances you have to keep track of, like <clears throat> if you build two uh, items that are like related or in the same category or something, they they're more profitable or something like that. Or you have to monitor the supply and demand in the market for these particular items versus these other items. You can figure out which ones are most worthwhile, which ones are going to make you the most money. And all of this was just so much to take in at the start. I thought, well, it seems like work. This is not my idea of hanging out on a, you know, an island vacation or something like that. Yeah, that's my thought is I don't hear a lot of like sitting around with your feet up while people bring you boat drinks. Yeah. Yeah. But as my island got farther and further along, and I started to learn more about this uh, sort of workshop mini game. I thought, well, this actually reminds me very much of like the business management mini game in Yakuza Seven. Oh, really? <laughs> Which I had sort of the same reaction to at first. So I thought, well, this just seems like too complicated. I don't know if I really want to get into this. But as I started to spend more and more time with it, I started to, you know, I'd I'd sort of pour over the um, like the tables where they tell you which items are going to be popular during the next session or the next week mm-hmm. or however they measure it and go, Oh, I just need a few more like vines or whatever to build this specific item. Or if I capture this animal, they'll give me the, uh, the materials I need to build this other thing. And I started putting together these very elaborate workshop schedules where items would just like chain into each other and, and give each other production bonuses. And at that point I was just like, Oh, Oh no! Now I'm kind of into this. <laughs> so, also, it's kind of a clicker game where it just sort of goes. It sounds it's a like. little bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like once you get a groove going, you can just tell them what to build, and then I kind of like the fact that it's time gated because they'll just work for uh, 24 hours in real time, and you come back the next day and they say, "Okay, here's everything we sold. Here's some new materials we gathered. You know, here's what the animals left you in the pasture." And then you just all put it back into the workshop machine and you go, all right, thanks again. I'll see you tomorrow. And (laughs) that's uh, pretty much the loop at this point. So it's not exactly what I pictured, but in terms of it being sort of an interesting piece of side content that uh, it is kind of relaxing in in a weird sort of OCD way, I think it's pretty successful. You know, it's not quite, it's it's definitely not the the housing development or uh, like an Animal Crossing mode like people were expecting it to be. Right. But it's it's pretty unique. It's There's not really anything else in the game quite like it at this point. Well, cool. That is a, um, a surprising and uh, unusual flex. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's really not exactly what I was expecting it to be, but, uh, <laughs> but it's interesting. It's interesting. And uh, I'm slowly making my way towards earning enough to get all these shiny rewards, which would be terrific. And can you sort of like leave this to sort of like go do other Final Fantasy things and come back to it later? Or you, you have to sort of stay in this lane until it's sort of game over? Or how does it sort of fit into your timeline as a Final Fantasy fourteen consumer? Oh, it's actually very um, sort of thoughtful in, in how it integrates into everything else. Because you can just go in and check in on it for like 15 minutes or, you know, not a very long period of time every day, or however you, often you feel like. Right. Because you set up these automated schedules with the robots, and you just all you have to do is make sure you have enough materials for them to complete all the orders. And if they don't have enough, they just stop producing stuff. It's not like there's a huge penalty or anything. Mm-hmm. So then you just check in on it as often as you want. Generally, that's like once a day. Or if you're... <laughs> this is another just weird thing that happens. If you're trying to capture a particularly rare animal on the island, you have to figure out when it shows up and stuff like that. So that's potentially another thing. But the workshop is really the core of the uh, the island experience, as it turns out, which is uh, seems a little weird. But yeah. uh, also, it's kind of unexpected and, uh, and unexpectedly fun, like that Yakuza business game. <laughs> Uh, it seems a little misleading to call it a sanctuary, though. It doesn't sound like, I don't know what the right word is, but like <laughs> island business opportunity. Yeah, yeah that, so that part of it's very weird. I mean, there is a very nice sort of lodge in the middle of your island hideaway where you can just chill out and But you, you know, can't live there. Scenery. Uh, you can't really live there, no. 
And of course, the community has already put together stuff like the, there's this spreadsheet going around, which is like the island workshop solver, I think they call it, where you just plug in the resources you have and what the supply and demand on your island looks like for each week, and it will spit out the optimal sort of workshop schedules to <laughs> maximize your profits. And I thought, well, that seems like a little much. I don't know if I need to min-max this to that degree. I'm kind of right, fine yeah. just <laughs> taking it a little easy. <laughs> but again, it reminded me, you know, during the heyday of um, of New Horizons, just plugging numbers into that turnip tracker. Yes. And going like, oh, maybe this Thursday, maybe Thursday is looking pretty good for turnips. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you could be doing that exact same thing on your island sanctuary uh, yeah. if you really want to get your uh, your your money up as quickly as possible. <laughs> Excellent. I have fond memories of the early days of the stock market. Going, what's everybody got for uh, turnips this afternoon? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yep. Um, so just it's kind of like weird shades of Animal Crossing popping up here and there, but uh, it's not exactly what it is. Gotcha. So, some mechanical elements taken from Animal Crossing, but none of none of the emotional elements. Yeah, well, so that's the the other thing that feels like that's the thing that's preventing it the most from being like Animal Crossing because there's not a lot of customization or anything you can do. You can build these structures in your hideaway, like you build the you build a cabin and then the a couple landmarks, but everybody just has the same three or four landmarks to choose between, and then once they're built, you don't really like get to customize them any further than that which is probably uh disappointing for people who are expecting this to be the animal crossing mode or whatever right in fact i see a lot of people saying like oh i mean i just you know finish this thing on my island and come check it out and you know maybe afterwards i'll visit your island <laughs> and i was thinking like well <laughs> what's the point because it's gonna look exactly the same as every other island i've seen so far right like maybe this landmark's in a different spot but otherwise pretty similar oh, that's funny doesn't quite satisfy that Animal Crossing itch. Not not quite as sort of customizable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Although if there's one thing that the the 14 team is very good about doing is they'll put out a piece of content and it's very much like the 1.0 release of whatever it is. And they'll just revisit it every few months and add stuff to it and flesh it out a little more. Uh, and a few of the stuff, or a few of the side modes they've added and updated in that way have turned out to be um, pretty good. Hmm. So I, I have high expectations for this thing to be further fleshed out now that it's finally released. Uh, there was even a rumor going around that they, they'll add additional islands <laughs> in future updates. So I was just like, oh, wow. calm down here. How many <laughs> islands is too many islands to manage at once? <laughs> uh, your budding archipelago. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. I mean, eventually, maybe. Excellent. That's more than Animal Crossing ever did, so... Yeah, they never even. Uh, I mean, you got to go to um, what was the other island? The uh, the one with the creepy dog guy living on it. Yeah, they all the, he has a, eventually has all the little vendors and stuff that are there. So he's got a little flea market. Yeah, I forget the dog's name, but yeah, yeah. I bet a bunch of Animal Crossing players would kill for a second island. It's <laughs> true. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Hmm. Well, anyway, so not quite the Animal Crossing uh, New Horizons experiment or experience that uh, some, some people were making it out to be. But, yeah. you know, definitely an interesting diversion from all the other stuff that came out in the last few sure. months. And if it was an exact, you know, Animal Crossing replica, they'd get no end of, of, of grief for it, I'm sure. So uh, it sounds like they've sort of stayed in the in the sort of lane of, of Final Fantasy. Yeah, yeah, I think it fits very well with everything else that's in there. Cool. Oh, the weirdest thing about it, this is the last thing, is that so it's, it's been hyped up as this side content for casual players, I guess. But you need to have finished essentially the entire game up to this point, like all the expansions, almost all the story quests, just to, uh, to access your own island. Like you can visit other people's islands, but you can't start developing your own until you've completed the bulk of the game, which I, it feels like a very strange choice to me. It doesn't feel very casual. No, not at all. Um, and it's kind of tied in with the story. They they make an effort of explaining, like, oh, you need a vacation after all the stuff that you've been through. So here you go. <laughs> but it feels like a huge missed opportunity. Like, like they should just send people out to this island as soon as they're ready to go. I think it's, uh, you know, I don't, I don't really see the harm in it. So yeah. that's a little confusing to me. I feel like that's a little unfortunate. But otherwise, 
I've uh, I've been enjoying spending a few minutes every day just hanging out in my hut or whatever and <laughs> ordering my robots around. Excellent. And paying off your debt to the raccoon. Oh, no, everybody's paying me this time. <laughs> Living the Tom Nook life. Excellent. What a baller. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I was planning to lead immediately into Harvestella, but that's not how a sandwich works. No, not at all. So tell me about We Are OFK. Uh, so We Are OFK is uh, this cool little... Um, oh, how to best sort of describe it? <laughs> a little bit of a... Um, it's a, visu- a visual novel, kind of, with music. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, the hook here is that you are um, uh, w- one of four different members, kind of, of of a <laughs> pop band, of, of a sort of a budding pop band called OFK. Um, they're not even called OFK initially. They get to that point eventually. <laughs> but... Um, uh, and each uh, of of one five one of five a- uh, episodes of this game f- focuses primarily on one of the characters of this band, um, and how they sort of go from working relatively unsatisfying jobs to channeling their interest in pop music and social media and things like that, songwriting, etc., animation into making a band um so it is kind of a, a like a television show more than anything it feels like um about uh yeah, about you know four friends who decide to be a pop band together structurally it's really it's kind of interesting that each one of the episodes here is uh, about an hour long the fifth episode's an hour and a half long um so it feels even you know in terms of pacing and size like a television show each episode has like an opening credits that feels very much like the op- <laughs> opening of a of you know an hour long um you know cw network television <laughs> show um sure, sure. yeah and um yeah and it's all very sort of like very trendy, very um, fashion-forward, uh, very generational-speak kind mm-hmm. of twenty-something mm-hmm. characters. Um, That's what uh, I got two from of the trailers. Yeah. Seems very hip. Do people two still say hip? Work. Can I say that? Uh, yeah, hip is a good word. I, I mean, I, I get where you're going with that. That's how right. I would describe it. Yeah, certainly cooler than me. Um, That's what I'm uh, trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. There, there really, there's not a single character in this game over the age of thirty. So, um, at one point, one of the characters facetimes with her parents, uh, and I guess you do see her mom's face on the screen. You're allowed to presume that she's an older person, but mm-hmm. um, yeah, more often than not, there's not anybody in any <laughs> in any role in this that's over thirty years old. Um, which is fine. I, I get generally a video game about sort of uh, you know building your own pop band. Is I'm not. As a forty-eight-year-old white dude, maybe not the target audience for that. <laughs> sure. Um, so um, you know, you get like the Wayne Coin story as a visual novel. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I don't. It's funny because I, I sort of like I, I was kind of comparing it to like where my brain goes in terms of like pop culture making the band kind of things because you know a, a bunch of friends who decide they're going to be a band together is kind of a cultural touchstone there's been various versions of of that story over time um and none of them quite play out like this but i like it occurs to me like all of the ones that i have in my brain like predate the age of social media predate the Mm -hmm. age of everything you do going on instagram um uh so yeah it's you know i keep thinking of things like the monkeys (laughs) or um uh what's the other one uh how it was a British television show about a bunch of kids who make a punk band. I had it in my brain. I, I missed I, that one. Yeah, I had it in my brain when I started making uh, uh, the episode. When I started uh, uh, thinking about how I was going to talk about this on the show tonight, and uh, um, shit, it's gone now. I'll have to Google it when I have a chance. But uh, but yeah, so like these are all very like you know isolated to their time and place. The monkeys, obviously, being seventies. Uh, this other one was from the eighties, I think. Um, and, um, and yeah, it was very kind of scrappy, very sort of like, you know, practicing in your parents' garage and stuff like that. And We Are OFK is not that story at all. Like all of these characters have very, fairly privileged lives. Two of them work for a video game, like a huge video game developer. Um, uh, one of them is already a fairly successful, um, music producer. 
Uh, one of them is a, also a, a fairly successful like computer animator. Um, she ultimately, uh, excuse me, they get the pronouns, pronouns right. They ultimately sure. create their own um, uh, uh, digital sidekick who is an animated cat that appears as a hologram. And that cat then becomes the fifth member of the band. <laughs> so like this is clearly like a a very sort of like time specific, a 2022 version of all of those other things. Um, none of it is sort of like trying to figure out how to play guitar or, or who's going to play drums or who can sing. Like they know their roles pretty well. They lean very heavily on electronics and being able to sort of like sample and, and, and use prefabricated beats and backing tracks and stuff like that. So it's, it's a very different way of sort of assembling music and seeking fame than I am accustomed to sort of seeing <laughs> in pop culture. Um, but that makes it unique. I think that makes it really, really neat. Um, uh, so much of the dialogue that happens in We Are OFK is not like face-to-face, -face, like pick the next thing the character says. It's you sending text messages back and forth to your mm -hmm. friend. Mm -hmm. That's um, very appropriate. So, totally. Absolutely. <laughs> right on brand. Totally in the lane with everything else that's going on around this. Um, uh, uh, yeah. It's a little sort of misleading because you're, I, I, again, I'm sort of thinking like telltale games and things like that. Like, I'm going to influence the outcome here. Or I'm going to help build relationships or build, you know, alignments between members of this band. It's a little deceptive in that the choices that you make don't really have any bearing on where, <laughs> where the game goes. Uh, um, interesting. That was how I expected it to go. Yeah. Um, there's no wrong choices. That You're just sort of giving kind of different flavor and different kind of color um uh sometimes it's a choice one of the characters luca is very funny it always has sort of a witty line or a joke or something so sometimes it's you trying to sort of decide like what is the funniest thing for luca <laughs> to text back um so yeah it's um it's it's very different it's very generational it's very sort of um you know i don't know what even what is that what generation is that those have got to be very young I guess Zoomers, right? I guess well, that's I Gen lost Z. track at this point. Yeah, Zoomers, yeah. isn't it? Uh, I think so. Um, so it's not you know, even millennials I anymore. I'm sad. No, uh, millennials have aged out at this point. Yeah, so these have got to be sort <laughs> of uh, 26, 27, 28 years old is probably a Zoomer. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. I, 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 I enjoyed it. I liked playing it. Like I said, the, the time investment was not significant. So I could, and, and the way that it sort of was initially released is they put out one episode a week, again, like a television show. Mm -hmm. um, so I would play one of the episodes, credits would roll, and I'd be like, oh, cool. Well, I'll come back to this in a week and I'll play the next hour and and uh, go through it again and, and sort of see the continuing adventures of how these four friends come together to make a band. Um, and uh, yeah, I kind of digged consuming it that way. I thought that was kind of a sly way of releasing it that uh, uh, it made you kind of like hungry for the next thing. Yeah. The cool thing about it as well is that they also put out a real single, like a real song that sort of came together as a result of their efforts through that episode. Um, uh, so that is not well, only like a song... they spend the episode putting it together? Not quite in those terms. You see sort of like... It's not like they're sitting around having like songwriting sessions or anything like that, but like the tone of the song kind of fits the tone of the episode. Oh, I see. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you, you get kind of a video gamey session near the end of every single one of these episodes where the the single essentially is is played for the first time in its entirety in the episode um and it has some fun little kind of mini game attached like an endless <laughs> runner game or a, a there's a cool one like the darkest song on there um it, which i really like is this kind of dark and creepy kind of gothy um uh like synth pop track essentially <laughs> and it's um, a very long buffet table and it has kind of a line of fire burning up everything on the, bu the buffet table and mm -hmm. you're sort of steering the fire and so like it becomes a little game in your head like how much <laughs> of the stuff on the buffet table can i burn up while it all sort of like the fire kind of lurches along to the beat of the music and stuff and I, I don't know. Like, it, there's no score attached to it. You can't fail out of it or do it poorly. There's really no value in going back and doing it again unless you just want to hear the song again. Mm -hmm. Which the game is very cool about doing is it gives you a link directly to playing the music video segment again in the menu after you complete the episode. It's cool. Um, 
Yeah, which I kind of liked. <laughs> you no, know? um, so yeah, it's it's almost sort of like are, you're familiar with the band The Gorillas. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, a f- kind of a fictional band made up of real musicians uh, pretending to be cartoon characters. Um, this is very much that. There's uh, uh, Teddy Deef, I think, is the sort of the director of the game, is also the vocalist, the lead singer of the band, um, <laughs> is one of the co-writers of the game, uh, and um, uh, is a real musician uh, and partnered with other real kind of L.A., you know, aspiring musicians to assemble these five tracks that make up basically the first EP for this fictional band OFK. Um, but the songs are real. They're on Spotify. I've been streaming them and I was listening to them on vacation last week and they're good. It's good pop music. It's, um, you know, kind of fun, a little light uh, um, synth poppy music. I think of bands like Churches, which I really like, or mm-hmm. Fantagram, which I really like. This fits kind of neatly into that little piece of music except you know none of these characters are real they're all based on characters from a video game uh and um yeah and the story about how they became a band is pretty fictionalized as well <laughs> their holographic cat of course. and their holographic cat yeah does that's cool it is cool yeah it's kind of been on my radar but i uh, just haven't gotten around to it yet i like the fact i mean it's been so long since i played an episodic game is that true i think so <laughs> the issue I had with them, like the the format, is really interesting. But I feel like even the best efforts to make a truly episodic game that you come back to every week, like a TV show, because I feel like that was the model. Yeah, they just didn't quite get it because like the ones I spent the most time with probably were all those um, don't nod games, which like all the episodes were three or four hours long and they would come out months apart. Right. Actually, they did a pretty good job with the the most recent one. The or not the most recent at this point, but um, the Tell Me Why one that came out, I think yeah. last year. That first season of Life is Strange, though, is those episodes were months and months apart, like so much so yeah. that like I remember you and I having to remind each other what happened in the last one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, I think uh, they were still right, were. kind of figuring out the formula with that one, definitely. Yeah. And clearly, we're sort of making them as it went along it wasn't sort of done like we make everything in advance and then release them on a on a cadence it was yeah because i think the next episode... there's no way you could actually do that week to week like a tv show right yeah uh unless you're doing it sort of as a, a cool little indie game where you can sort of bucket it as a little one hour episode uh, you know i think there's a lot of heavy lifting that went on here obviously is they had to in addition to sort of making the video game you also had to write record produce a pop song. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so not to sort of say that they had it easy by any means by making We Are OFK, but yeah, these are not three to four hour long episodes of, of super interactive video games like the Life is Strange ones are. Yeah, but I mean, it does sound like you got through them in about an hour or so, uh, and then you're ready to go for the next week, which is cool. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, hmm. Yeah. It's cool. I, I I would recommend if for some <laughs> if if this sounds interesting to anybody. Uh, it's a beautiful looking game. It's super stylish and super stylized. Um, you know, these are characters that hang a lot. So they have a cool club that they hang out at. They go to a boba shop and drink boba and chat Ooh. with each other. Um, and it, it is a lot of sort of like cliches in my brain living on the East Coast of what I suspect it's like to live on the west coast particularly in la um (laughs) kind of how i envision la yeah the characters are cool they're all very sort of like specific personalities and are very sort of real i think uh um there, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of diversity to the cast. Uh, um, I, I mentioned earlier that one of the characters goes has they them pronouns. Um, everyone in the the group is somewhere on the LGBT spectrum. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of really kind of you know cool uh, um, uh, uh, identity that goes into this. A lot of cool representation has gone into making this thing. Um, uh, the credits roll at the end of every episode and there's an animated v- picture of every person that has contributed to making the game oh. um, and th- super diverse as well. So again, I think it, it's a very cool indie collective experience that has gone into making this really unique and kind of unusual take on a video game meets music art piece. Yeah. I forget where I first saw this. Was it, I want to say it was... Um, it might have even been in, in a Nintendo Direct, but uh, it was almost for sure in one of those wholesome Directs as well, right? Because it just seems uh, like 
it would fit there pretty well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it fits yeah. right in, even though you're not farming or you know, running a cat cafe or whatever. <laughs> or a cute frog witch or something like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I was surprised. I think this this was on a, a Direct or a Nintendo Direct recently, wasn't it? Because it's on the, the Switch. Is that where you were playing it? I'm playing it on the Switch, yeah. I think it's out for... I don't know what it's out for in addition to the Switch, but it is definitely... That's where I'm playing it on the Switch, yeah. Hmm. Uh, so, well, yeah, oh, this I, is... I definitely want to take a look. Or take a yeah. lesson, rather. <laughs> uh, this is called We Are OFK. We Are OFK. Um, the music is up on Spotify or wherever else you want to listen to music. Uh, I would recommend just even checking out the tracks if you've already got a Spotify subscription. Just play the music. Uh, all five songs from the EP are out right now. Uh, if that is interesting to you, then go back and check out the video game, which is also really well done. Yeah, it's cool. It'd be interesting to sort of see where this goes to see if, you know, there, there's hints at the end that maybe they're going to go on tour next or something like mm-hmm. that. So, so like, you know, do we get five more tracks? Do they do their first album? Do we get like a live show and a road story? And so there's a lot of places you can go with this, I think, that are kind of neat. And it's, uh, um, again, sort of all kind of uniquely done through uh, um, the lens of, of, of something very modern and something very, you know, other than than my little life in Pennsylvania. So, yeah. Um, that's cool. I dig it. It was fun to play. Nice. Yeah. Well, I'm glad it turned out. I'll have to check it out. Some, some of the, one of the, at one point in the game, so the, the the emotions in it get very heightened. Very like there's a lot of you know there's not a lot of stakes in this thing. Like at no point in the course of playing it do you ever are you ever concerned like oh geez maybe they don't really make the band maybe it's a miserable <laughs> failure. So you're not like on pins and needles like hoping OFK gets their shit together. Um, uh, one of the, at one point, one of the characters loses their their job, <laughs> so, uh, so like that's like the highest stakes that come up. But there's also like a lot of little personality conflicts. A lot of people kind of pick fights. Um, somebody makes a weird choice, and then the other characters are mad at them for like an episode and a half. And I'm like, I think you're being like unreasonable. I think you're, <laughs> like my perspective <laughs> on it was like you're being really mean to that person. <laughs> And, um, but again, I, I look at the world in a very different way, and I manage my relationships in a very different way than maybe your average 20-something does. Mm-hmm. Um, so, again, it's just a very sort of different slice of life than, uh, you know, I generally see sort of represented in the media that I consume or in my own personal life. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's cool. I, I, you know, I, I, real or not real, I guess it's not for me to decide, but it felt like it had some sort of genuine kind of human emotion behind it. And, uh, yeah, a little sort of like love and care went into sort of crafting this thing that felt very, undoubtedly very real to the people who were making it. Yeah. Has this prepared you? to uh <laughs> like roll in the work next week with your we are ofk shirt be like <laughs> hello fellow kids <laughs> i mean i would rock an ofk t-shirt i think that's yeah, kind of yeah. fun yeah i my wardrobe in general is banned t-shirts um oh, there you, know, you go but most of my wardrobe is not you know anything under the age anybody uh, anything under the age of 25 would probably recognize <laughs> so um yeah that would be interesting i don't i'm not sure you know yeah, yeah. Uh, i like the music i think that is more than anything i like i don't find it offensive i i think you know if this was sort of making a country western band or something like that or oh, i don't know what else i would not be necessarily into but it helps that like oh there's some cool hooks to it and like the chorus is very sing-songy and the the fifth song man is a banger and i had it in my head all week and yeah. so yeah like if you have five good tracks and you build kind of a cool cartoony story with some interesting characters around it i can get behind that i think that's fun oh cool. Video games have certainly been built around flimsier concepts, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I like that this has some some element to it that sort of actually kind of transitions into my normal life of me sort of driving around in my day-to-day and going to work and listening to OFK on the radio. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, it's neat. I get to do that with a lot of every game that comes out. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, you're super into video, uh, video game music. I see that pop up in your your Spotify history sometimes. Oh, um, sure. Yeah, and I, I don't always. I don't. I wouldn't even say often. I wouldn't uh, listen to sort of video game scores or even movie scores and stuff like that. Um, but uh, I do like, you know, I do like a song with a hook. I do like a chorus I can sing along with. Yeah, it sounds like um, a little poppier, probably. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um. So that is called We Are OFK. Uh, I'm playing it on the Switch. What, cool. um, and all the episodes are out. They are all out now. Yeah, the, uh, uh, it's been 
This came out when? Sometime in August. So all five episodes have come out now. I, I, I believe if you were just to download it from the Switch store right now, you'd have access to all five episodes. You wouldn't have to wait a week in between. Would you recommend waiting a week in between just because? <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. I liked waiting a week in between. It, it, like every Thursday, I would <laughs> like get up, start my day, and go, "Oh, cool! There's a new episode of OFK today." Huh. Um, so it's kind of fun. I, I, I don't know. Not a way I generally consume video games. That's kind of one of the things I like about the play date is that for a long time, every Monday, I was like, "Ah, cool! Two new games today." Yeah. Um, so it does. Yeah, there is some kind of fun value in in sort of measuring it out. Um, but, you know, like a Netflix show, if you want to marathon the whole thing and just bang through it, go for it. Yeah. Well, do, I mean, I don't know if you can answer this question. I was wondering if it feels better or, like, intended to be taken a week at a time rather than going through all five of those at once. Because I feel like there yeah. are some shows where I've watched after they've come out. So I was able to binge it a little more than you'd be able to normally. And I feel like it really changed my, uh, like, appreciation of those shows. Or really, like, just distorted them uh, it was a very different experience i imagine that people got watching them when they were here live yeah i um i don't know i'm mean, clearly the creator's vision the director's vision was for it to be consumed episodically a week apart mm -hmm. um uh, uh you know otherwise why would you make your game come out that way so um uh yeah i mean maybe if you want to sort of respect it uh, the vision of the creator if you want to consume <laughs> it in the way that they had it sort of originally intended um yeah, yeah measure it out a week at a time mm. um i mean this is not like lost where you're going to be like at work talking about oh my god you see last night's episode what do you think's going on with jack um so there's not a lot of like cliffhangery moments in this but uh i don't know there was something kind of fun in the waiting hmm. yeah it's kind of a it's a Experience you don't necessarily get as often, uh, especially there are so many shows just that are on streaming now. You get them all at once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You couldn't do, uh, and I'm gonna sound like a very old guy when I talk now. But you couldn't do like a Lost experience anymore. Like, I mean, did you watch Lost? Was that part of your? Did you consume that? Was that one of your uh, things? No, I, I no. never really got into that. That's the last thing I can think of that was a show like that, where it was really like you were starving for the next episode. And it's all you could talk about. And it was everybody had theories. Um, and, you know, as a creator, obviously, that's very hard to live up to. I so <laughs> I do not envy the people who ultimately ended up fumbling <laughs> where, where Lost went. But um, but yeah, that's sort of like cultural juggernaut of like, oh, my God, I cannot wait for the next episode. What is even going to happen? It's just not really a thing that is built into the way that TV is consumed anymore. Yeah. Uh, I got it a little bit with uh, the Better Call Saul, one of the shows that I've, uh, one of the few shows that I've sort of watched in, not exactly in real time, but like as it's airing. Yeah. Um, from week to week. And I just thought, oh Same. man, remember this? I can't remember the last time I watched a show like this. Probably, actually, I watched all the new Star Trek shows like that, but I blocked those from my mind. So not yeah. thinking about them. Yeah. I think the, the, so, I mean, the interesting thing about Better Call Saul is, is, is if anybody's ever seen an episode of Breaking Bad, we know where that story goes. Um, but the thing that was sort of like surprising and, and salacious <laughs> a little bit about Better Call Saul is sort of like, how does it get there? Um, uh, so, yeah, again, I think they did a really – the creators of that, who, are, who incidentally are the creators of Lost, did a really good job of sort of measuring that out and making that journey to a known destination be did interesting. Who, which of them worked on Lost? I don't know that. Is that the um, – Oh no, I'm I'm confusing. Uh, uh, Gilligan did um, X Files, not Lost. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay, I was just like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> Never mind. Yep. <laughs> I'm getting my TV producers confused. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's a good show. <laughs> not to be confused with Lost, <laughs> or I don't know. I shouldn't say anything because I've only seen like one episode of that. But I, my general impression was people didn't care for it by the end. No, no, they they lost a lot of the capital they built over the years, unfortunately, by by not sort of tying it up in any satisfying way. Yeah. Um, Unlike we are okay, it sounds like. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which continues to be a delight and has a just a, a really fun resolution to it that I really enjoyed. So, um, yeah, would recommend. Uh, uh, cool. Would cool. also recommend Better Call Saul. So yeah, there you go. Sure. Yeah, just get that in there. <laughs> Man, speaking of tying things up in a satisfying way, uh, I was going to talk about Harvestella, but we're 
feel like we're almost at the end of an hour. Maybe yeah, I'll just talk about it next week. You Maybe. and I dug a little, a little too deep. <laughs> we'll do a little open-faced uh, farming sandwich or whatever God, whatever we were talking about at the beginning of the show. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I don't know if I've ever eaten an open-faced sandwich. Do people do that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That used to be one of my things. Well, what was your open-faced sandwich? The, uh, come back. Back in time with me, DJ. <laughs> <laughs> to, to an era where um, I... Um, oh, this was the mid-90s. Uh, I used to, with friends, go to raves. Uh -huh, okay. Have you heard of a rave? Have I heard of a... Is that a real question? I uh, Yeah. I, sometimes I forget. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, for those who don't know, <laughs> you don't have to explain. No, raves? I don't have to explain what a rave is. No. is that a Do people still use that word? I mean, I don't know how often raves are happening anymore, but I feel like that is just like <laughs> I don't know. Back when all electronic music was called techno. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the um, days. Yeah, and these these would go all night. It, I would eventually sort of run out of steam at like four four thirty in the morning. Um, and one of the few places that you could get anything to eat at that point when you were starving and probably still a little bit drunk with your friends um, was the Gold Rock Diner in Hartford, Connecticut. Oh, and um, <laughs> twenty four hour Greek diner in downtown Hartford. Uh, and one of the things on their menu was called the Happy Waitress, and it was an open face grilled cheese and tomato sandwich. Okay, well, that sounds amazing. It was awesome. Uh, I had a lot of those in my 20s. And um, uh, yeah, not an experience that is sort of uh, satisfyingly replicated as a vegan, unfortunately. Mm. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, th those were very, very good in the in the world before I stopped eating cheese. Okay. All right. So yeah. I, I was actually... just trying to picture what uh, sort of the, the platonic open face sandwich would be. And I was just like, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if that's sort of like the gold standard, but that's the one I've certainly consumed the most and got me through many a many a long night. Yeah. <laughs> well, excellent. I'll have to try it out for these days yeah. when I get back from my next rave, perhaps. <laughs> um, let's wrap this thing up. If you need any more video game hangover in your brain, you should follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash VG Hangover. And you can always get show notes and links and tell us what you thought about this episode at VGHangover.com. If you'd like Just to, to be clear, I, I will talk about Harvestella next week, not yes. to keep everybody in suspense. Yeah. So we'll do a little, you know, back-to-back -back farming shows. <laughs> and the cool thing about this is it gives me a little time to play it, because I didn't get a chance oh, yeah, to check yeah, out the yeah. demo. So. That'll be good, too. Yeah. Um, uh, you can join us on Discord if you would like to hang out with us and chat about video games. Tell us about the time that you went, a rave, went to a rave. Invite me to raves. I'll go to a rave. Let's go. Um, oh, all right. You, standing uh, invitation, or what's the, I, the the on the other end of a standing invitation? Uh, I don't, I don't know. An open face grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I, I, I mean, I do want to say I do need to be home by ten thirty at this point in my life. So, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. It's gonna be interesting. <laughs> yeah, we'll be the first to the rave and probably the first to leave. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, hang out on Discord, chat with us about music and video games and all kinds of other fun stuff. There is always a link to that at vghangover.com. There's your standing invitation. There you go. Um, and we would love for you to subscribe, rate, and review us on your podcasting app of choice. Um, uh, hook us up by telling your friends about the show, too. We, uh, we appreciate that immensely. Yep, that would be great. Um, as we said, we really appreciate that. Helps us out a lot. Uh, we want to give thanks again to Saria Lemus this week for our intro and outro music. If you want to hear more of her work, you can go to pettypanol.bandcamp.com. Uh, where would people go? I mean, you mentioned Spotify, but the, do the does OFK have their own Bandcamp or something like that? Not a Bandcamp that I'm aware of. Let me, uh, let me do okay. Well, if they're yeah. not on Bandcamp, just Google it or whatever. They're probably set up. Yeah, like I said, you can listen to and kind of play the little music videos in the game if you want to just grab it sight unseen. Um, but it is um, streaming on uh, on YouTube, on um, Spotify. I presume it's on Amazon Music and things like that as well. What's the other ones? Title. <laughs> <laughs> Are they on Title? I did that. I don't know the answer to that. I've I've never had Title in my life, so I don't. I am untitled. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I was going to say if they were a real indie band they'd be on Bandcamp but I, I don't even know how that works yeah I, uh, I don't know how yeah I'm not sure either 
Unless I can um, um, yeah, prove or disprove that. Hey, it looks like it, uh, we are of case on PlayStation 5 and PlayStation 4 and Nintendo Switch and on PC. Oh, um, well, so there's there you a go. lot of other cool places that you can uh, consume this thing. There's um, no escape. The band's website is ofk.cool. <laughs> that's good I, I like that <laughs> so so yeah that's a thing too apparently so <laughs> oh they've got merch oh i'm gonna have to look at this look what you've done all right well while he's doing that just head over to pettypenal.bandcamp.com get some background music for your merch browsing <laughs> uh my name is randy dickinson uh my name is dj ross we'll be back next week thanks so much for listening to video game hangover Goodbye. Goodbye. See ya.